Okay, hey everybody and welcome to the third week of our lunchtime lectures. Um, today we're welcoming Benjamin and Yara. Um, thank you both for coming. So first I'll do my quick introduction and then we'll get started. Um, so Benjamin Endemoser is an architect and researcher based in Los Angeles, California. He studied architecture at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna and the University of Innsbruck. He has been a lecturer at UCLA's postgraduate program since 2016, and he has also taught at the University of Innsbruck, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, the University of Fine Arts, um, oh, and the Yuncheng University in Taiwan, sorry. Um, Ben's work is situated within the field of advanced technology. His focus is on computational design, digital fabrication, applied robotics, um, VR and AR, new media, machine learning, um, and digital um, experience design. He has published and presented his research on machine learning and architectural international journals and academic institutions. In addition, he has worked for a number of architectural practices such as Gensler, Graft Lab, New Territories, and LAAC Architects. He is a licensed architect in the European Union where he founded his own practice, Benjamin Enemoser Design in 2016. Um, welcome, Benjamin. Um, Yara Fegali um, is a Lebanese architect and principal of Folly Feast Lab, an experimental design studio based in Los Angeles, which she co-founded with Vivian El Kmati. Um, Folly Feast Lab creates visual, uh, visually led immersive and interactive experiences to address present social and urban um, issues. Yara is a lecturer at UCLA also, teaching design and research studios at the graduate level. Before that, she taught at Städtschule Architektur um, class in Frankfurt, Germany, leading design studios, visual studies, and seminars at the postgraduate level. Her research work interrogates um, the territories of architectural education's core curriculum and speculates on the role of emerging technologies in designing our cities and new media. Um, before starting her own practice, Yara worked for five years as an architect in Beirut, where she is licensed. Um, she holds a Master's of Architecture from the Lebanese Academy of Fine Arts in Beirut, as well as a Master's in Arts in Architecture from Städtschule Architecture class in Frankfurt, and did Master's in Design Theory and Pedagogy from SciArc. Um, welcome to both of you. Thanks. And Benjamin, yeah, you can start anytime. Awesome. Naomi, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm just trying to find my notes. Here we go. All right. So yeah, thanks again, Naomi, for the introduction. Also, thank you so much for uh, to Julia for for the invitation to present my work and also talk a little bit more about in detail what I've been doing in the last couple of years, especially at UCLA and in my practice. So um, as, as Naomi already mentioned, I studied uh, in, in Innsbruck and in Vienna, and uh, I was teaching for five years uh, at UCLA um, at the Ideas campus uh, together with Kevin Giselle, who is also faculty at UCLA, and he is leading that technology studio. And um, I also, as Naomi mentioned, I have I've been teaching in Europe and Asia, and uh, I also served in various academic committees, contributed to peer-reviewed papers, and also presented my work at conference symposia. And it's it's an, a great pleasure to have the opportunity to present my research and also work as an academic and as a professional today. And uh, just to, to get started, I situate my work and research, research within the fourth industrial revolution, uh, where multiple devices, humans, uh, uh, and uh, software collaborate and coexist uh, next, next to each other in an ecosystem of technologies. And through so-called like sound physical systems, uh, machines, and again, softwares and humans collaborate and interact and coexist aut autonomously. And here, for example, we see a robotic fulfillment center 
which represents like one of those ecosystems of technologies within the fourth uh, industrial revolution that are capable of demonstrating awareness and space and each other and exist and exist autonomously so we see a nonlinear behavior of individual agents or components within the system which is based on an increased intelligence of such of such elements and then we will also see like and learn more during my lecture about artificial intelligence um, as well as machine learning and machine learning is part of of the overarching and umbrella of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to show some projects uh, you mentioned I did at UCLA over the past um, years where we investigate those autonomous systems such as robotics and how they're integrated and interact with each other uh, and humans in, in order to activate, interact and fabricate space or architecture dynamically uh, over time. So in this particular example, it is a combination of industrial robotics and soft robotics. Uh, soft robotics is a new version of robotics, while the industrial robotics, they're like hard and rigid robotics. And we see those different modes of actuation, interaction, and fabrication combined within one, one brief. And there is a precise component of human machine collaboration and also machine vision at the core of this project. Uh, but more importantly, two robotic systems, as I already mentioned, with very distinct characteristics are combined together. And while the rigid uh, industrial uh, robots follow the laws of inverse kinematics, the soft robotics are actuated through pneumatic systems. And especially when talking about human machine collaboration, soft robotics are very important due to their soft and human tissue like nature. So if a human is working, collaborating with robots and creating or fabricating space, this could be a new technique and a very important technique to be explored uh, to have a more safe um, coexistence between humans and robots in one in one space. And uh, while this particular example also shows various modes of robotic actuation, uh, fabrication with real-time sensing and human intervention in, in this process. And here, for example, we have, we have done some research integrating VR headsets uh, and the notion of telepresence in the robotic fabrication process. And here, once again, uh, there's a human intervention into robotic fabrication process through VR, where the students or the instructors, whoever, can wear a VR headset and actually control and, 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 and use the robot as an extension of their body and create and fabricate various different, um, different objects. Uh, and also my work as a researcher and as an academic uh, works at intersection of technologies and space where I bridge physical, the physical space with the virtual environment and heavily investigate visual media such as uh, the latest VR and AR technologies. And more specifically, virtual reality and augmented reality tools are used to extend the physical space beyond its real world and material constraints. And when bridging uh, the physical with the virtual space, integrating physical elements into a VR, VR or AR environment into an XR, which stays for extended realities. This is, for example, a project we also did at UCLA with the students, uh, where VR, AR, and XR is used not just to perceive space, but also to generate and expand architecture beyond its material constraints. And in an ecosystem of technologies, uh, these design methodologies come together as, again, cyber physical systems. What I explained earlier mean that a lot of like different devices, softwares, and sensors are within one ecosystem, and they're all communicating and talking to each other, and so to say, creating a, a continuous feedback loop and inform a system of information between those devices. And... Um, in this example, for example, there are digital and physical spaces are blended between robotic systems, machines, and again, softwares. And here we see a research that explores the spatial uh, and interactive potential of physical computing, like meaning like small robots and small uh, electronics uh, and how they interact with, uh, with, with humans in cell physical systems. So these examples uh, show various spatial sculptures that are small scale robotic systems created by the students are also by the instructors as part of the research and different sensory systems and sensitive skin like membranes and complex materials behaviors were created to make the system aware of its physical environment and respond to human intervention. And although there is a, a long tradition of uh, yeah, physical computing in architecture already, um, this uh, somehow uses a more human machine collaboration approach. 
and in, in, in this particular project that is called Massive Movement, that sums up all the ingredients I was talking earlier in terms of architecture as a robotic system, but just in a bigger scale. It is a proposal for a dinosaur extension at, uh, at the Museum of Natural History in New York City. And with multiple functions in terms of exhibitions, robotic research lab, uh, and, the, and um, exhibition hall, um, and also like some outdoor areas, the user directly defines the actuation and transformation of uh, robotic actuated spaces within, within the current composition of, of the architecture. And through artificial intelligence, machine vision elements, uh, four special robots are able to sense the environment and interact with humans in real time. This is a view from the street uh, where you already see the four uh, uh, robotic architectural spatial elements and how they are exposed in order to transform the interior and exterior of, of the building. And this is one of the, the spatial uh, robotic systems which hold temporary exhibits that are produced in the in-house robotics lab or we have the um, another like uh, robot that is an anatomy theater as well as like um, a holographic uh, yeah, animal theory and then we also have the um, flora and fauna robot and a new research that recently took part or like moved into the overarching um, terminologies or overarching research of, of my work is uh, about artificial intelligence and uh, in tandem of the shown technologies I'm trying to focus how to integrate artificial intelligence and more specifically uh, machine learning into an ecosystem into the ecosystem of technologies in order to explore how machines can perceive, analyze, and actually generate the built environment, uh, which I think could be a future perspective. And this is, this is an example of research that is being done by NVIDIA that shows portraits or pictures of humans which haven't existed before. So all of those images are completely artificial, but thousands, hundreds of thousands of portrait photos of humans have been shown to a machine, a computer, and basically the machine learned or has been trained on how to generate or how a human face might look like. And within, within this, um, yeah, the views are playing, within this new component within the ecosystem of technologies, the artificial intelligence and the machine learning within my work, I distinguish between behavioral versus generative AI. Like on the left, you see like behavioral AI that like helps to generate and simulate and predict certain behaviors of characters, of robots, of actors, of agents, whatever. So uh, whatever have you. And on the right, you see generative AI, where we use AI, artificial intelligence and machine to generate new proposals and new ideas of, of, of architecture. So this, for example, uh, this was research that we have done at UCLA, where we, were sh uh, we gave the students like multiple um, buildings in downtown LA uh, and basically they, they looked for like artistic precedents which were shown to the machine and then the machine algorithm was asked to generate or like transform this new building or the, the, the existing building into a new look based on the artistic influence or precedent. This video is not playing, so I played by hand. Or oh, this is a very, very recent research we have done at UCLA, uh, where um, we were like uh, also like giving the robots like behavioral agency, like using behavioral AI in order to generate and and actuate design in real time, as as I mentioned earlier. And this is, again is also like uh, research done by Google, where they were like trying to blend different taxonomies or like different species uh, of animals, for example, from a dog into a chicken. And they were like researching how does the, the, the iteration between one species to the other look like. And I'm asking myself the question, how can I blend different styles of architecture? How does an architecture look like when it is blended in between two styles? And when I'm tasking a machine, how can the machine perceive, see, and also generate architecture differently from how a human would do? And another research that is done by, by the UC Berkeley, what I'm very fascinated about is that you actually can translate semantic features. Like for example, the left, is, is a horse and the machine was tasked to, to transfer or change the horse into a zebra. And the result is actually surprisingly well done. 
And here, for example, you see a data set. When I'm talking about a data set, I'm talking about messy data sets. They are huge. Keep in mind that you need like 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 50, or 100,000 of images of a zebra from all different angles, all different directions to teach a machine how a zebra looks like. And then you do the same with a horse, right? But again, they are huge, they are diverse, and um, people making those data sets have also like a big, big responsibility because you are responsible teaching a machine about a specific content. And this premise, like how can that be used in architecture, uh, was was uh, was used in the project ML City uh, artificial hybrid cityscapes, where I investigate the power of artificial intelligence and machine learning to hybridize and generate new cityscapes from architectural data sets. Here, for example, I used a very important architectural precedent, the Barcelona block, and uh, basically clashed it and hybridized it with the Los Angeles suburbia, like two very different architectural models in architectural history, but also urbanism. And uh, the machine created a complete new proposal of a city with very different densities, structures, ratios, and socioeconomic um, um, possibilities. Now, and then, for example, I'm in particular interested how the machine perceives, analyzes, and generates architecture through its own lens that differs from how a human that probably is biased might do. So, for example, pay attention how pools are deemed as essential in, in the elements from the LA data set and incepted to the Barcelona block along with suburb features. Or in this one, how plant versus grown architectural structures like between Marrakesh and Barcelona might create a new taxonomy of architectural elements. And we also tried to do that uh, in order to predict climate change, where we were like training uh, different landscapes before and after climate change and actually tasking the machine to predict how new areas of the world could be more inhabitable after climate change, while others might not be inhabitable at all once the climate change you know, takes, takes its effect or get, takes even more effect at, as it already does. Which was leading to very surreal and very interesting proposals uh, of like urbanism and settlement between streams or like after flooding and, and what, what one might have in a scenario after, after climate change. And here we see some examples how cities uh, could exist uh, further um, as, as an archipelago or an islands while other areas of, of an existing city are already flooded. And this happens in a very interesting um, I would say synergy, I would like to explain. In this synergy, for example, uh, the designer, the architect is like a curator, right? And uh, it's slightly different as, as usually architects design at work. But in this scenario, uh, the designer is creating the data set and making the decision what kind of data set that is, uh, that is important. While the machine has two different uh, components, a generator, which is like an art forger, like it's, it's constantly trying to make new predictions. And then there's a discriminator, which is like the art critic. And the art critic helps the forger to get better and better as longer the machine is training those, those data sets. And within this, this duality or this cat and mouse game, uh, a machine is able to, to basically learn, but then also uh, create. And all of those knowledge and every possible prediction of, of, uh, of a data set is stored in the latent space. And each of this depiction of a city, of a house, or whatever you might be training has its own justification because it's all true. So it is creating a new sense of manifold realism. And all the research and my projects you have seen so far are based on image-based um, image uh, uh, machine learning. So I gave it an, an attempt to actually train 3D geometry of thousands of like modern houses in, in California, like these ones. So if you take those images and then you task a machine to generate a new depiction of a modern California house, you, after long training, you might end up and if I'm talking about long training, I'm talking about training of days and sometimes weeks. But then if I, I was interested like to not just train images, but actually train 3D geometry. So in that sense, I, I created a 3D data set of modern California houses with very typical architectural elements and architectural um, qualities, attributes, and so, so ever that are represented within uh, a Los Angeles modern house uh, data set. And this is when you look behind the scene, how a machine learns, uh, 
how a modern house might look like. So this is just an evolution of the training process, so to say. And once you let that finish, uh, you end up in a result like this. And uh, as you have seen, this is, result is quite quite different from like the machine learning approach uh, as, it, as you have seen it like training faces. Like because usually AI, artificial intelligence engineers are looking for the best possible depiction or replication in such a process. But I'm looking for something that is not so accurate or like where the machine actually makes mistakes and the machine actually uh, does not always do a good job. And when the machine does not do a good job in the interpretation of a data set, it creates artifacts, which create new, very interesting architectural elements, like here, the balcony, the facade, the openings. While it is very, very confident in keeping the openings, like the, glass, the, the huge window openings. So I'm actually looking for the, the glitches and the misinterpretations and the misjudgment of the machine when working with a uh, particular uh, data set which I think as a designer is very, very interesting. One might call it like happy accidents or um, errors in, in the algorithm. But I actually think, you know, if a machine misinterprets like certain architectural elements, we as researchers and architects might have the possibility to, to investigate and actually stumble uh, onto, onto something new. And this is the, the final video and also the last thing I would like to show in the presentation, which shows the house and it's, it's all different elements from the facade to the massing, to the openings, um, to the infrastructure, to the circulation, everything that is generated by, by, by the machine learning algorithm. In that sense, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And again, it was a great pleasure to, to show my work and my research and explain it in a, in a little bit more depth. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Okay, thanks, Ben. Beautiful. Just, just give me a second while I share. Okay, great. Um, so beautiful work, Ben, as always, like super. Sorry, it's black. We don't see anything. Yeah, it's meant to be black. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe, can you move your Zoom? Um, this yeah. one? Yeah, the one on the right and the one on the top. Yeah, sorry. Thank you so much. No, <laughs> thank you for telling me. Um, yeah, I was saying beautiful work, Ben, like, you know, uh, the use of really cutting edge technologies at um, ideas at UCLA AED in your studio has been really, really impressive. Uh, and I'm happy to see, you know, all of it in a timeline right now. And thank you, Naomi, for the generous introduction. And of course, Julia, super happy to be here and present uh, my work. Hopefully, I'll be quick enough. Uh, so I'm um, excited to show you what uh, I've been up to, but mostly where I started and why I consider what I do today part of architecture. Um, so I'm Yara, I'm the co-founder with Vivian of Holy Fist Lab, which is an experimental design studio based in Los Angeles. And um, basically we would be classified as an indie game studio and we create visually led immersive and interactive experiences to address present urban and social team, um, themes. And what we mean by that is that we have three core values. The first one is social. So we are people-centered, our perspective, our point of view are really people-centered. Uh, we are urban because we work with spatial context of existing spaces, of ex existing places um, in LA and in um, different parts of the world. And the last one, which I have relates a lot with uh, what Ben was just showing you is technology which we work with virtual reality, photogrammetry, which means 3D scanning, uh, artificial intelligence and networking, which I'll explain in a bit. Um, and basically we work with this, these kind of tools and um, our whole work is in relation to data, um, a bit differently than Ben just showed, but really in relationship with data and how data can uh, help us or how can we with data understand design and architecture uh, today. Um, so before I go into our uh, little uh, indie game studio and what we do, I wanted to uh, give you a preview of the work. 
that uh, where I started. So as um, Naomi was saying, I'm Lebanese. I originally um, studied in uh, Lebanon and then I went and I studied in Germany. And this is what I thought architecture was like. <laughs> So I found like an interest in ornament. And for me, this is what a building um, would look like in a funky architectural um, uh, way. So this project is a student housing, if you can believe it. And it's based on uh, Bernard Chumi, which is a French architect who um, is um, the designer of the Parc de la Villette, which is a public park in Paris. And I was really inspired by his architecture and I was taking these different pieces and putting them together and adding ornament. And this is really where I started to find my own interest and develop my research um, uh, that led me to look into things from a different point of view, I would say from a different perspective. And I went and studied um, the history of perspective and vision in art and architecture and it led me to produce work that was uh, film-based, uh, spatial. Uh, so this is actually in a full room, but you're seeing it on the screen right now. Uh, work that was immersive and that was based on reflection around narratives and around ways of seeing, of looking at things around you. Um, and then I came to LA and I continued the research um, which um, I started to use data sets, like Ben was just mentioning, using artificial intelligence. In that case, it's really a fancy word for saying that I was using a lot of images of building facades, and I was intermixing them with a lot of images of roses in this case. And I was wanting to see how one aesthetic feature would affect another aesthetic. So how uh, what would like, if you want a rose building look like? And in the same way you could think, um, you know, what if I take a different bouquet of flowers or what I take anything other than a building and put it onto a building? Does a rose or a flower becomes a window and what happens to the basic component that form architecture like stairs, window, walls, uh, once aesthetically they're so different that they remind you of something else. Um, so to put this more clearly, one of uh, one of my research were on the arts district in downtown Los Angeles, uh, where the building that you have in front of you uh, was suddenly turned into this kind of aesthetic. And um, at that time, our research was really developing into ornaments and the Bavarian Rococo, which is an art period in um, Germany and Austria, which developed um, a refined sense of ornamentation uh, that was specific to that region that is called Bavarian Rococo. And I started to think about how spaces could be different and what would be the stories of these spaces. What would it mean to have these ornaments that look like jewel, like fabric? And what would it mean in terms of architecture to rethink the city through a completely different lens? In this case, the lens of AI, artificial intelligence trained uh, by looking a lot, by looking at a lot of data of these fabrics and these um, aesthetics that you see applied onto the building. And the way I was showing these spaces, the results, you know, in architecture is as important as the way you produce them, was by using um, movies, by using moving images. So it was always a use of media. Um, and it wasn't like a drawing or a plan or a section, but it was really thinking about how you could experience those spaces as a user, as a viewer. Um, so what you see on the screen now are two VR um, headsets on the left and on the right, walking through the arts district. Um, and you see that on the right, you can see that building that we started with. Um, and the arts district has been transformed with this new lens. Um, uh, and this is an image of, you know, the continuation of this kind of thinking is how do you let people experience those spaces? And this is an exhibition setup um, that we did with a different VR station where you would be able, and that's another one, where you would be able to walk in and experience all of these spaces. Um, and that VR research, um, you know, how to experience those spaces, how to exhibit and let people come and experience those spaces, led me to work with 3D scans. So what you see on the screens, uh, you can recognize as, as different spaces 
uh, that have been digitalized. So they've been um, turned into a digital uh, version of the physical space, which we call a 3D scan, or we call a photogrammetry, uh, which is what I um, adore to work with because it remains a really, um, uh, a really close, uh, that a really close connection with the actual space since it's a digital copy of the actual space and still you can add um, you know digital elements to it so you're somewhere between physical physicality with the scan and digitality which is really where my interest is uh, same as Ben mentioned before which is working with virtual reality augmented reality it's really working with the physical and the digital and being able to shift between them uh, with different degrees of um, you know having more phys phys uh, physical versus uh, more digital and what I'm showing now on the screen are students work at um, UCLA AUD and um, I just want to show you the way we present the project is really done through um, through using media, media, new media, and using uh, moving images. Um, and equipment and architecture is now on. So the student had developed this little movie to explain what her project was about, and this is a bit <laughs> the way we work. Move forward for the sake of time, but it's hi. I'm Ivan, and my project is another. I'll move um, further for the sake of time, but I just want to show you the way, um, you know, different ways, different mediums through which architecture could be presented. And this is another student, which you know. Um, oh, what's up, guys? <laughs> with the era of Zoom, we really he used the aesthetic of Zoom to present his project. I'm going to show the first like ten seconds. I'm Michelle. Welcome to my channel. Today, I'm going to take you to my absolute favorite boutique in LA. The upcycling room is always my destination to upcycle my old T-shirts. Just follow the simple refashion your old T-shirts. See me think how people look and contribute to the music. You can also saddle up with. The So we work with music, with sound, with narrative. Narrative is super important in the work we do in our um, at UCLA, but also in my own practice. So it's really working and learning through all these different mediums and picking up on contemporary trends. And um, this brings me back to what we do in Fall with East Lab, which I hope you'll be able to link to architecture. And the first project is called Belonging. And it's a project that was developed during a pandemic. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, but um, last year uh, during the summer, we worked on Belonging, which is Amal's Queer Road Diary. It's, um, we were invited by the LA Forum for Architecture and Urban Design to be part of Five Architects' vision of LA in 2020. Of course, that was right before we knew there was a pandemic coming. So we had to really change the way we would exhibit the work and the exhibition that we were part of work was called Everything Changes. And um, you can see a bit um, the look of different uh, type of work that were there. And our work uh, was an immersive experience as we work always with experiences. And since it was the pandemic, we wanted to bring people inside the work. So we did a drive through garage well, people would drive in to a residential garage in Silver Lake and they would you know, be able to experience the projection on the walls instead of wearing the VR headsets, which would be impossible during, during COVID. Um, so we had to make them drive in a car that they would stay inside the car. So we would have the car in a room that was fully immersive and projected um, with projected images on the walls. And um, we would project the story of Amal through 20 different, 25, I think, different neighborhoods in LA. 
where you can see them here, we would recreate these different houses using photogrammetry, which means, you know, 3D scanning, as I've showed you before. And we would use uh, our narrative was uh, the lesbian stereotype that you would find on different front porches. So that was our setup. It was a residential garage, a car, you would drive in and you would experience the work inside the room. And these are, um, you know, our, our scans of these different houses. And um, after working and processing, it's really about making it look seamless like one city. And you know, the, when the work, when we know the work is done is when it looks um, uh, real, like you cannot see that it's actually a combination of so many different things. And the way you would do it is that you would drive into that garage and you would be able to look through your car windshield and windows and experience that movie. So I'll show you a piece of it. So the little part you see on the left would actually be the wall in front of you and the longest part on, uh, sorry, on the right and the longest part on the left would be the wall to your left. So it's story of acceptance, of being different, of Amal, a queer um, Middle Eastern person coming to LA and trying to find her identity through these different uh, neighborhoods and trying to look uh, like find Charlie, like look for different signs of uh, being part of that new community um, through these different suburban neighborhoods in uh, Los Angeles. And uh, yeah, so that's the setup, but on the right, you can really see from the car when you're sitting what you're looking at and it really looks like you're driving through a neighborhood um, that's someone else in their car and what it looks like from the street. Um, and another project we have, I hope I still have some time, is uh, talk about Beirut. As I said, I'm Lebanese and um, uh, last summer there was a really big explosion in Beirut that changed a lot of things. So I got invited uh, to co-create an activist project where we wanted to raise awareness and uh, uh, you know, lead our uh, network to a donation link for um, everyone in Beirut. And um, it was shown in Studio 106, A plus D Museum in Los Angeles, the Wedge Gallery, and also in Digital Saloon podcast. And we work with graphic designers and many people from Beirut and um, interested in Beirut around the world, the world to create a version, a digital version of uh, Beirut before and after the explosion. And we were in the part right after uh, a few weeks after the explosion and we had someone go and take uh, photogrammetry. So take 3D scans of the building and how they were damaged. And um, we're hoping to convey the story of these spaces and the different life that you know, have been touched. But it was really about uh, Foley Feast taking a stand and you know, started to think about how our work could have an impact uh, that is further than, um, you know, being uh, our interests, our aesthetics, our uh, disciplinary concern and um, to the wider public, but how do we really touch on uh, social political um, issues that are, we are very concerned with. Um, so what you're looking at on the screen is different scan of um, the spaces and uh, yeah, we were really thankful to be invited and thankful for any, anyone who donated and helped out. And our last project we'll go really quickly over is Mediterranean and Sea Diaries, and it also deals with the Mediterranean Sea, so with the Middle East, and it's an interactive AI-generated VR forum. What it means is that it's a place where it's like a game where everybody around the world can put their headsets, their v virtual reality headsets, which means you know, the goggles, they can put them on and they can communicate uh, in the same room about different issues of um, around the Mediterranean Sea. And it was shown in Fiber Festival with Gallery and it was published in a, a recent journal about virtual reality. But where our research started is really looking at, uh, you know, our phone, our technology and where that actually comes from and the e-waste that is generated from all of these different technologies and try to understand how our a design, how you know, objects are designed for the dump. This is the technical word, but basically what it means is where does it originate and where does it end and what happens to our 
you know, phone, tablets, anything that you throw away, what happens to it. And it coincides with a crisis in Lebanon that was also dealing around trash, where a group of women and activists started to meet up and decide to take these, uh, uh, these problems into their hands. And these are actual image of uh, four to five years ago of um, you know, the trash problem in Lebanon. And we really wanted to ask, what is the afterlife of overproduction? So what happens to these extra technologies that get dumb, that get overproduced? And we developed this um, aesthetics and this environment which, where you could access through your VR headsets, like I said in the start, and you could have a conversation inside of these spaces uh, around the different topics that touch on uh, recycling and uh, digital waste. Um, so all of our projects in Foley Fist Lab end up being a, a kind of a game where you can have access and have discussions as and, and it uh, deals with networking, which means many people at the same time can go into that space and have discussions. Uh, in this case, it was relating to UN goals for a sustainable future. Um, and I think that's a you know, little uh, walk through the space and what it looks like. So from belonging to this space, it's really um, centered around narratives and around gathering people in virtual reality in different places uh, through photogrammetry to discuss issues that are at the heart of our concern and uh, personally as uh, me and my partner uh, the concern that we have in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, Lebanese, in terms of women and all of that. Um, so this is how I get from <laughs> doing building to doing what we do today. Um, I hope I didn't go over time and thank you so much for listening. Great, perfect timing. Um, okay, so we have a couple questions from the students. Um, I think this one was directed at Ben, but I think it can be answered by both of you. Um, and it's about the relationship between artificial intelligence and architects and um, what the role of architects is when artificial intelligence has or like when we've taught it so much, I guess that in potentially in the future, it could do things by itself. I don't know if that's possible, but what you see that relationship being about. Maybe Ben, or, yeah, first. Oh, or Yara. But I think, you know, uh, congratulations on the question. I think it's a very interesting question. It's at the core of what I think Yara and I were, were showing. Um, so I think there will always be a dependency um, between the machine and the human. Um, of course, there might be a scenario when there is like um, a super intelligence like Nick Post Bostrom, right? Is explaining it like that, like there's an intelligence that oversees or like basically exceeds all human capabilities, but we are, there's a long way to go there. So I think we shouldn't be worried about being out of jobs. Or like those are usually the first questions we get. I think we should be excited because the work of the architect might change quite a bit. And I think that's the that's the the exciting, but also partially frightening part. But for you as the new generation, uh, you can own that challenge, right? You really, really can own uh, taking taking a part in that in that evolution or like in this new paradigm shift. So I always, you know, again believe that there's a dependency between the architect and and the machine or the the AI or the artificial intelligence, especially because I try to point out that uh, you as a designer, you're always creating the data set. And uh, to put it in simple terms, um, think about your history teacher, right? Your history teacher was teaching you his point of view of history, right? And it's a huge responsibility as well as like putting together data and teaching data to someone who hasn't been exposed to that subject before. So uh, to cut it short, like to put it short, I think this relationship between the curator and the generator and so forth uh, is, 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 is will always stay. And I think it's the exciting part. And, and you, you as designer have to own that role that certain things are automated, but you can steer and control it by deciding which data is being fed, fed to, to the system, basically. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, there's always that fear of the other, of the new, of you don't know, you know, is it going to take your place? Is it not? But if we look back and we look at, uh, you know, 30 years ago, 30, 
maybe 40 years ago when uh, we started to have computers more accessible to everyone, you know, people were frightened in architecture. We're like, if we're not drawing by hand, then how are we going to have a job if a computer can draw a line instead of me? And it was the same debate. And what we saw is that architecture just evolved to have different concern that, um, you know, that were uh, like the conversation shifted completely. And that shift, by the way, was really aided from by Greg Lynn, who's also a faculty at UCLA and teaches at Ideas, which really did, you know, he's the one who brought architecture into the digital age, as we call it, which is uh, he brought architect to stop drawing by hand and started using computers. And um, what you notice is that things just evolve and the conversation becomes different. So it's a very exciting time now to be part of architecture because this is happening with AI, with this these, uh, our relationship to data. Um, the discipline is really evolving into something different, changing, maybe not evolving, but changing. And this is always an exciting time to be part of um, what's happening in architecture. Yeah, great. Thank you both so much for that answer. I guess another question that I have is, so last week the students were introduced, I think mostly for the first part to programs like Grasshopper and how Grasshopper can control like CNCs. Um, and I was wondering like, what is the version of that in what you guys do? Like, what are the programs that you use to control the output? Yeah, so we, um... I'll answer half of the question on a few software and then you can do the other, which are not software. But uh, what we use are called game engines. So uh, what we use is called Unity and it's a game engine. A game engine is a bit different than a software, but it's basically a place where you can code uh, different, uh, you can put in different codes that will make the platform do anything you want. So if you ever, you know, if you played Pac-Man, you know, if you play World of Worldcraft, these kind of um, these kind of games and worlds are built in game engines. So it's a very wide. It can do a wide spectrum of things, um, and this is why it's uh, highly uh, editable, and all of it happens through coding mostly. Um, so that's one part of what we use. And then you can continue with the second part. Yeah, that's that's already a, a very good list. And I think at the core of most of the stuff we, we have shown, it is about those game engines, um, which again is very exciting because that's also very new to use those engines like in um, in the world of architecture. And what Yara was saying earlier, like 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when Greg Lynn uh, pioneered the computational design, architects all of a sudden used a software that was native to uh, CGI and Hollywood and the entertainment industry, like called Maya. Uh, like, for example, animating dinosaurs for Jurassic Park or like whatever was not real was like exotic and uh, exciting in terms of like its form, behavior, animation, and so forth. Uh, architects didn't use, they all of a sudden started using it and then create this new paradigm shift. And which is also the reason why a software like Grasshopper is actually developed right so this is all goes back to this to this long evolution and then yara and i we, we also use like different machine learning pipelines they're all developed by um by companies like google or facebook uh because they are integrating those technologies also um on on, on a daily basis like when you're like searching for something on the internet or if Facebook is suggesting you an advertisement or like proposing your friend or whatever, uh, this is all using those technologies, not to make uh, advertisement for those companies, but just to give you a background that we are living in a very digitized world where AI is actually, it's not, it's not something very distant. It's actually very, very close to what, what, what we are like um, dealing with on a daily basis. Um, so we use those, those machine learning algorithms. We do a lot of like coding as Yara said in different like languages like Python or C sharp, um, which sound very scary and very frightening. But if you take uh, the right classes, it's actually super easy and it's super fun. And actually I would bet that most of you already have dealt and learned those coding languages in high school because yeah. that's also a new evolution that the students from year to year, they know actually more coding than the generation before. And it's more natural somehow. It's easier yes. to understand. 
the way like you communicate because the language the languages that uh, Ben are mentioning are a way to communicate between you and the machine so you can you know you can you're able to have a di dialogue like I need you to do more like this I need you to do it's really a conversation it's a language it's an actual language and um, what we see with newer generations is that it's getting easier for everyone that is younger and younger to be able to code and to be able to understand in these languages so we see it as a very um, you know as you would be able to code your own way of doing the drawing. You would be able to code your own way to design. But it's something that is always collaborative. Like you, you hear a lot about catch words like artificial intelligence, but there's always a human, you know, you, you need to decide things for the machine. It doesn't work alone. It does, it's not able to do everything on its own. It's always in relationship to you. And it's really a pleasant, you know, a discussion or in back and forth that you have with using these different languages with the machine. Great, thank you both. So a question from um, Akira, who's a student in TNARC, um, for Benjamin. Um, do you expect that AI may one day be able to design a building that is indistinguishable from one designed by a human? And on another note, are there any innovations in VR and AR technology that you hope to see in the future? I think this is also, again, a question to Yara as well, uh, but I'm going to get started. So, yes, I think it's possible that a machine can um, design something that is indistinguishable from, from a, what a person would design. Uh, if that is the case, um, I lose interest in, in this technology, so I can tell you that. But I think it's going to take some time uh, because what 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 would that mean? Like I showed you those examples of like when the machine was generating perfectly indistinguishable new faces. That's amazing, right? And, and an artificial intelligence engineer would say that's the holy grail. I achieved I achieved the highest possible outcome of of my of my research. But again. I'm 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 feeding the machine ordinary architecture like architecture that I that is not so exciting right architecture that we already know, and I'm expecting the machine to do something I don't know yet right otherwise I could just do a copy paste so in the meantime until this happens I think it's still it's still quite exciting um, and the other question and I'm I'm very curious also what Yara has to say because this is this is something that that bothers me uh sometimes quite a bit but also like uh, it's also like very hard to answer but what i would like to see in ar and vr is um that what we already have just gets better and better and more immersive i think that's that's how i would put it down um like for example if you watch a movie like ready player one what they suggest there i would love to see that that the blending between the virtual and the physical becomes becomes more seamless that uh the spatial immersion is just like getting even better like because right now you can't distinguish the difference between looking at a real object versus like looking through a vr goggle of course there there is there's still a lot of work and innovation to do but i know that we're going to get there so i'm i'm hoping that this this transition or this that it's like re, um, virtual and physical or reality and virtual reality uh, gets less and less distinguishable almost like if you would watch a movie like matrix and um, it's it's about the degree of immersiveness. That's that's what I would say. Yeah, I I would have to second that. Like for example, if you're using, you've all used these AR apps where let's say you're on Amazon and you're buying a couch, and if I ask you, oh, do you want to try on your phone? They'd ask you, oh, do you want to try to see the couch if it fits in your living room? And then you put it to your living room and then it scans the room with the same photogrammetry, you know, the same scanning technologies, and it tells you, oh, this is that big. But you always realize that the you know the couch looks off. It might be uh, black. Uh, sorry, early morning in your room, and the couch looks a bit darker. Or there's always you know that um, awkward um, awkward uh, distinguishment between the digital and the physical. And as Ben is saying, you know it would be great if we get to a place where they're able to read your location, your time of day, the quality of the light in the room, and so many different parameters that they would be able to adjust what you're looking at. They would be able to aim so many more. But it, what we're asking is for more and more data to be used so it's more accurate. Um, but while we say that, we're both extremely interested in the inaccurate and the messy and you know all the outcome of the dirty um, part of working with these 
uh, different software. Um, so in a way, it's interesting that it gets better because then it becomes new problem emerge and it becomes way more interesting to work with it. And uh, in terms of VR, I would say you know it's really troublesome for to say to stay a long time uh, like long periods of time in VR because of dizziness because of so many different factors. So I hope this gets better uh, so VR is integrated as much as AR is already. Um, so my hope is that VR uh, gets developed and and raise it, arises way better and come more comfortable to use so more and more people use it. Great. I guess one final question, and hopefully we can do it quickly. I don't know. Um, have you both seen a change since the pandemic in interest in VR and AR? Especially, I mean, because we're on our computers all the time, has it become a more common um, tool that people are using? And how do you, yeah, I guess, how do you see that going forward? In, I think in all areas, you know, the fact that we had to teach remotely, we had to work remotely a lot, it boosted a lot, like Zoom, you know, it becomes like, I, I'm on a Zoom that wasn't a sentence before. Um, so I think a lot of the technologies that we use have been uh, advanced pretty quickly during that time. I would say in terms of, I would say in the world of art, since you cannot go to museums, you cannot do a lot of things, all of these were held through AR apps. Uh, you know, there's a firm in London called Acute Art, and they specialized in projecting um, art, uh, augmented reality artwork in, the, in different places of the city. Uh, which works exactly like Pokemon Go. I mean, it was a hype, so I hope all of you know what Pokemon Go is. And in terms of VR, you know, a lot of events for gaming, which always, again, because it's a gaming engine that produces things in VR, a lot of people in the gaming world are more advanced, the same way as Ben was saying, you know, in the start of the digital, the digital in architecture, it was really entertainment industry, like the movie industry in Hollywood that was really advanced. Uh, in today's world, it's a gaming industry. Even the entertainment industry, the movie industry is looking at the gaming industry to produce the next, because this is the most advanced technology in terms of realism and uh, computing power. So in the gaming industry, I would say VR has evolved immensely because you're able to, we're able to have this discussion if we all wear VR headsets and we scan our bodies, we're able to have this discussion in digital space by being there present like digitally, but as a whole body. And you can see us move, we can talk, we can visit different spaces together. So also in terms of tourism there, uh, you know, we started talking about digital tourism. So I would say, yeah, enormously it evolved um, in a, a lot of interesting direction and a lot of really intriguing direction, but also in terrible ways. Uh, but I think that's the cost with um, technology or everything that evolves so quickly. What do you think, Ben? I I, I just absolutely agree. I think it's it gave us a huge boost. Like like it was almost like we were like I don't know preparing without knowing that we are preparing using those tools. You know all the all those years and then all of a sudden everything made sense. Why why we are like working on telepresence, like putting stuff in VR, looking at stuff in VR, and and so forth. And uh, so I cannot add anything to that. I just can give you like two personal, um, two personal examples real quickly. One is like during the lockdown, I had an Oculus Quest, uh, the new one, and I went to the Oculus store and I enjoyed like going on to 360 views of Paris, of Tokyo, of Rome, Berlin, LA, where they like during the pandemic put on a 360 camera. And it was just fantastic to just look around, right? Even if it was empty. Just like feel like I can go outside, although I was sitting in, in my on my sofa in, in, in my living room. And the other one is I just recently talked to the creative director of one of the biggest VR studios in LA. They were producing, uh, sort of producing right before the pandemic, like a VR workout uh, app, so to say, where you can work out with the VR. And they said that their sales skyrocketed through throughout the lockdowns and the pandemic because people are like, I want to exercise. Uh, I want to work out and they just they just use vr like to to run and jog and work out in in central park while they were like in the living room so just to just to support what 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 yara was saying it just gave a huge boost to to what we believe is is the future and i think that's very exciting to see yeah 
And the difference, just one more last detail, because I think it's super great what you're saying, Van. Like the last detail is like in VR, you because of networking, you can experience these, let's say, workouts as a group. You don't have to do it alone. It's not like um, maybe AR is more like an alone thing because you experience it in the space or it's GIS located. So it's located somewhere in the city. But uh, VR, you can really put all headsets and, you know, jump into that workout in Central Park or wherever else. Uh, on an island somewhere else and you can you know enjoy this experience together even though you're like completely in different place and it's a bit like we're doing now on zoom and it's getting more and more um understandable and easy for everybody to do like we all are fine right now we're being in completely different spaces and we're looking and hearing the same you know conversation and having the same discussion so i think that's pretty exciting and pretty impressive and yeah it's really exciting where we're going with that technology. Great, thank you both so much. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. And I'm sure the students learned a lot. Um, I think we've gone over so the students, most of them have class right now. So they're probably all gonna be leaving, but um, yeah, it was great to hear from both of you, thanks. Thank you so much and good luck everyone. You're the future of architecture. So hopefully you join us and we do exciting work together. Thanks Thank so you much. all. Thanks so much for coming today. Really nice seeing you. Great Bye, seeing everyone. you. Bye everyone.